Hi, my name is Patrick Lohr, and welcome to Demo Camp. This is David Gluzman, my co-organizer. A couple of entrepreneurs have put this space together, four other entrepreneurs. We've got five great demos for you tonight. First up, we have Patrick Rousseau from Bud to Bud. Rules for Demo Camp, six minutes. It used to be 10, but people were just too damn boring in 10 minutes. If it looks like a PowerPoint presentation, we're gonna pull you off. Patrick, what are you gonna show tonight? Uh, I'm gonna show Butt to Butt. Butt to Butt uh, is there to uh, help people listen to music together where, wherever they are. Butt to Butt is a bit um, uh, like, uh, I would say, MSN Messenger. You have uh, your account, and then you have your friend's account that are online. Uh, we have a concept of DJs and partiers. If you're a DJ, uh, you're there to uh, accept party requests or invite people to your party to listen to your music. Uh, if you're a partier, you're uh, willing to join a party or you're looking for a party to join to listen to music. So it's an app that you run in the background. Uh, it plugs into uh, your favorite media player or your audio source. So uh, in this case, I'm using uh, iTunes uh, to play music. Um, here I'm in party mode, you can see it party mode here, and then I've got my friends that are DJs uh, that are playing music right there. So I'm bored of my music, my library is old, uh, I'm tired, or I see something that's new that I haven't heard of before. I can just go in and uh, let's say I'm going to go and party with uh, DJ Stash here. So I, I asked that person, uh, can I join your party, uh, and then they accepted to join that party, and right now as you can see, I'm listening now to their music. It stopped my iTunes, and I'm listening to uh, Mr. Brightside, The Killers. Uh, so it's that easy, and it's in real time. It's to the second, so if you look at the, uh, the time elapsed there, it's 3 minutes 20, 21. So we're exactly at the same time. So if you're saying, wow, what a great drum solo, it's that one that's being played, because he's hearing the same thing as you. So, and you can be up to five people in a party. Um, why is that? It's a copyrights issue. We're keeping it under fair use. Uh, it's free to use. Uh, we're going to be launching uh, our public beta probably in two weeks. We're in private right now. Oh, Mr. Stash is playing some Paris Hilton. Um, so, so in that case, I would go under my party and I would leave promptly. <laughs> and go back to whatever I was listening to uh, in iTunes at that point. Because even though you're in party mode, you can still listen to your own music. It just tells other people, hey, I'm more than willing to listen to whatever you're playing. Um, so we're going to be in our public beta in the next couple of weeks, uh, and you'll be able to enjoy it. Uh, we have tons of features that are uh, more social. That The core that I just showed you guys is there, but you can see uh, other people, what they've been listening to uh, historically. You can uh, song crush whatever you've been listening to. So you've listened to a great song from somebody else. You want to keep a record of it. You can song crush it. Uh, you can post in real time on Facebook or Twitter what you're listening to, who you're partying with. Uh, in your history, we keep a history of who you partied with, etc. How many times have you, uh, so, uh, if you want to party again with Paris Hilton? I should have declined, actually. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, we tend to give you all the tools for you to discover music, but at, at the same time, listen to it. That's it. So once we've launched, we're going to be working on the on a premium version, so the Pro DJ Pro version, where we're going to uh, basically make the parties unlimited uh, if you pay uh, for the service, because at that point, then we have to pay copyrights uh, for your. It becomes a uh, kind of kind of a concert, so we have to pay for every song that you play. But it will give you other advantages like. Uh, being able to listen to full songs after the fact. So when you look at somebody's history, you'll be able to listen to whatever they've been playing after the fact as well. But the free version won't do that. The monetization model? Uh, so right now, this is going to be, uh, it's based on iTunes. So whatever you see, you see always a download on iTunes. So you can always buy that music, and then we get a, a commission off that. Uh, and obviously, when we're going to get a lot more users, we might in integrate some uh, sponsors for uh, so ads. 
Because I would think and DJs so, when I have their own channel and they pay you to have their own channel. Uh, no, DJs will always be just uh, people like you, you and I. Because we're going after uh, more of a Facebook model than a Twitter. We're not going to be just at large. Uh, we're going to be for your friends because that's where music recommendations, where the number one music recommendation comes from. It's actually your buddies that tell you, hey, have you heard that album? Yeah, you do get influences from other places, but that's the number one place. So you said this was a plugin that works with popular uh, music players. Is it just like Windows Media Player and iTunes? Or do you so have right now we're launching on Mac and iTunes to start with, okay. uh, and then as we grow, we're gonna. The first step is gonna do to, to do the the Windows version uh, and Windows Media Player. We had done it in the past, but yeah. we completely rearchitectured the butt to butt in the last year or so. And then for uh, connecting to your friends, is it like a peer to peer architecture of? Uh, like distributing like who's listening to what or do you connect to a central server when you're uh, listening to the music? So we're, we're an hybrid. Uh, we do peer-to-peer -peer and we do oh, client cool. server. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any plans in your roadmap for like, alternative music sources like Spotify, RDO, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it won't be an issue at all. We uh, already have the architecture for it, uh, but it's just timelines and, and debugging. There, there, there's a lot. Whenever you do peer-to-peer, -peer, it's monstrous. It's, there's just so many bugs, it's crazy. So, quick question, how long have you been working on this? And two, what can the community do to help you guys out? So, we uh, founded the company in 2009, be users, and spread the word, you know? That's all, uh, that's all we can ask for, It's just uh, spreading the word, try it out, open up an account. And, uh, you know, obviously the more people you have in your, in your list, the more variety in music you'll have to cho choose from uh, to listen to. So, you know, it's for you to you know spread the word, and you'll get better music to listen to. Thank you very much. Uh, how many people are right in the midst of a startup? Fantastic. I feel for you guys. <laughs> Who here? has piles and piles of money. I'm talking like hundreds of millions of dollars to fund these young startups. Anyone? Anyone? Hello? Sean Abbott, way in the back. I know via. That's the guy. Sean, give everyone a wave. Okay. We hope that you brought a bunch of business cards and we hope that you make at least five or ten friends tonight. Okay? And that you uh, make some kind of connection, find a developer, find a friend, Find somebody's shoulder to cry on because you've run out of money for your company. It's all good stuff. So this is a space, I hear it's basically a desk rental place. It's kind of like, it's rent by the hour. No? <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, there's rooms by the hour in the back. Um, it's, <laughs> it's not rooms by the hour. It's rooms, it's desks, it's desks by the month. We do a six month, uh, we, we try and get members in for a six month period. We're bringing mentors in and just trying to provide the resources and connections, you know, uh, that are sort of necessary to get somebody who's pre product and free revenue for the first time. Commitment 325 month to month. Okay, and you guys just opened, what, a month ago? Yeah, a month ago. Hey, I'm Josh Pinter of Community Point, and uh, this is our row back here, as you can tell by some of the screensavers. So we moved in about a month and a half ago before this place was really up and running, and honestly, it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, we, literally, in the past two months, we've seen more productivity than in the past, like, nine months of kind of kicking it around in a dungeon at Arts Central, and we we're actually next door at Tint, and, like, the activity here is amazing. Just talking with Christian and Victoria and Peter, like access to these people, or I mean, it's worth the price of admission. So I mean, you know, whenever you're, you think about buying a or you know buying a desk or, or renting a desk, it's not what it's not really renting the desk, right? You're renting the access to the activity, right? The the motivation and uh, the invigoration that you get from from working with a bunch of smart people. Brian, uh, so I'll just give you two seconds about Matchlock uh, and why we're doing it. Uh, I hate looking for work, and I hate trying to find people to do work, so we set out to build the eHarmony for business, except for we keep track of how many dates you get. <laughs> so uh, what we did is we inverted the traditional model uh, to make it easier for project owners and vendors to find each other. It's a two-way communication channel where none existed before. Vendors find the jobs they want and let project owners know they're interested. So what we really worked on here, uh, and I'm going to log in, I swear, 
uh, what we really worked on here was uh, we realized, uh, so we've been up and running for about six months and we've got, uh, we've got some folks up and uh, using the system. And uh, at about the six month mark, that's when you start uh, getting beat about the head with the obvious truths. Uh, what we realized is that um, we thought we were giving people what they wanted, uh, which was information and lots of it. And we quickly realized that uh, we were giving them too much information and it was difficult for them to sift through all the projects and the raw data to pick, pick matches in these situations. Uh, so what we did is uh, we built a recommendation engine to help these folks find each other. Got to try and remember the password. All right, so we built a recommendation engine here. So we're using, uh, as I mentioned before, predictive analytics to do the heavy lifting to find the best jobs for vendors and the best vendors for owners. So the first thing that we're going to see, and again, I apologize, it's a little rough here, but the first thing that we see here is uh, from a vendor perspective. Uh, this data that you're seeing is a uh, subset of uh, actual production data. So we just took a copy of it to give you some sort of idea of what it actually looks like. Uh, what we see here is from the vendor, um, they can come in and they're going to go ahead and search for jobs. The first screen that they see is a mechanism that allows them to keep track of the jobs that they've got, but also rank those jobs. A key indicator in terms of who I want to pick for my job is if they think my job is their number one, I think I want to get matched up with those folks. So if we go ahead and do this, we can just take jobs from our list and then we can uh, sort them wherever we want to go on the list here. So we take uh, our 85 in Benton, Arkansas, and I really like that one, so I'm going to put it on the top of my list. That way when we start doing our predictive analytics, we can understand that that's the number one thing on your list. Uh, five jobs doesn't mean that's all you can do. You can obviously pick a whole bunch more jobs. Uh, but this is a mechanism to cut down on some of the gaming of the system. Uh, you know, people just picking every single job and, and hoping for the best. Uh, this mechanism allows us to really hone in on that. The next thing for these folks to do is if they want to find some more jobs, we'll go ahead and do that. The first thing that we do right in their face is uh, kind of walk them down the candy aisle. Uh, what we're looking at are jobs that match with what they're doing or who they are. So uh, you can see who the job's coming from. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of Walmart on here. Walmart's our, uh, our only owner at this point in time, but we're working <laughs> on the rest of them. So we've got a lot of Walmart stuff here. Uh, we've got a quick job description here. We've got some key information for those folks. There's uh, obviously the deadline for them to uh, express interest and the estimated start of that work that's gonna happen. Uh, and then there's a number here, and that's the 93%, and I got myself a couple of, oh, sorry. I got a couple of notes here, so I make sure I uh, tell you what these things are. So these numbers are how close this job matches, and there's uh, four parameters that go into this. It's uh, similar jobs that you've been on the bid list for or have been awarded in the past. It's distance to the job, how close you are. I know that sounds trivial, but the further away people are, the more it ends up costing the person who's paying for it. There's an other party's uh, component, which means that there's lots of other people interested in that job, we're going to downgrade that score. If there's nobody interested, we're going to tell you that's a great one to go for. And there's also a like function in here, which means uh, if you've seen jobs and you click on uh, not for me, uh, we're going to try and push those further down the list. Okay, so that's the rating here. So uh, in this case, I want to go ahead and bid on this job. I can have a quick note that allows you to let the owner know uh, why you want to bid. Uh, One minute. Oh, well, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, there used to be 10 minutes here. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to go ahead and put us on the list. Boom, we're off to the races. Let's go in and let's see what it looks like for the owner because I only got a minute left. And we'll log in as the owner. And our password. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take a look for a job here. 1304, which I happen to know is in Warsaw, Indiana. And so here is the, uh, the results that come out from this. Uh, so from the owner's perspective, they can see all of the folks that are interested in this. Uh, and the, this rating score here is analogous to the other one. It's distance to the job. It's the similar jobs that they've been awarded on. But there's a couple of different things for these folks. It's uh, the key thing is their financial capability. So we keep track of their last three years of revenue and we compare it to the amount of money that the owner has spent with them to see uh, where they should actually end up. And uh, I think that's probably just about it for that. All yeah. Right. All right, let's, let's end her up there. Thank you.
Questions? What is the business problem that you're solving for uh, your potential customers? Uh, well, I'll go back to what I was talking about before. I hate looking for work and I hate trying to find people to do work for me, and that's exactly what the challenge is for those folks. What you have here is a, uh, yeah, Walmart uh, as a big vendor. Right? Yes. No, they're not a vendor, they're an owner. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah. owner that has projects that uh, you know, they want to uh, uh, contract vendors for. Yeah. Uh, so they have an issue with uh, managing that process? Is that they have an issue with finding people to do work for them. So the, their big challenge is that they're always on the hunt for new vendors to go ahead and work for them. And uh, the, the real challenge that we're looking at here is a big data problem. So these folks here, uh, I know I'm probably not allowed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> so, there's 394 vendors on this system, and so when I'm trying to find someone to go ahead and do the work for me, I got lots of people clamoring at my door to go ahead and do the work for me. I've got to try and pick the best guys to go ahead and bid on that job, or pick the best person to do the work um, for me. Wouldn't they have a short list of vendors uh, typically that they would go to when they have projects? Well, that's traditional. I agree with you 100%. But the major problem with that model is that uh, that is uh, it's non-compliant uh, from a compliance perspective from a corporation. The real challenge is: Are you actually getting the best deal? If I'm often going to Josh here, uh, what's to say uh, Josh didn't buy me a new swimming pool, and that's why I keep funding the jobs to him? So this kind of model here, we're cutting out huge amounts of time for the owner in terms of finding those folks and the overhead of trying to pick all the different folks to get uh, on the job. So what's the target market for this? Who's uh, buying the system? Or who's participating in this? So people who are looking for people to work for them. So uh, we started out in commercial construction, but we think that it's uh, going to be fantastic in IT consulting or uh, the next uh, block of oil wells that you want to go ahead and buy. So the idea is that we best match you with uh, the parameters of the work that you're looking for with the opportunities that are out there. How many questions involve in, in the profiling the person? Ah, that's a great question. So eHarmony does that. They have uh, 29 parameters. I looked it up on their website. Uh, we think that's a huge waste of time. Um, it, it works in that kind of case because they're trying to look for uh, uh, compatibility. What we're doing is we're doing it on big data. So we're looking at all of their history. So when I said we track all their dates, we know what kind of people they've wanted to go out with in the past. We know which dates have been successful. Uh, we know, you know how it ended up, so we will try and find the more dates that match that model. Do you use user-based or item-based similarity t between users to when you make the recommendations? You two are similar, Josh, and you are similar. Yeah. Josh likes the job, which means that you probably like the job no, too. No, no, we, we don't care about Josh. Sorry, Josh. Um, <laughs> it, it's all about you as an individual as to what you've been successful with in the past. So you're talking more about an Amazon type of model whereby, you know, Josh bought this book and I bought a book that Josh bought so I'm probably going to want to buy what he bought. No, that doesn't really match in this model. It's more along the things that you've been successful doing, how far away from the work you are. So we're trying to identify the best opportunity for you in the future. Go ahead. So you're trying to get the buy-in on the Walmart side and then everybody else is forced and they want to work for Walmart to go through the system. Hey, that's exactly how it works. Yeah, so the chain model for us here is, is the owners there's a transaction that happens between the owners and the vendors who want to go ahead and do the work, and the next opportunity for us is to create that chain further down, which is also the subcontractors in that model. Go ahead. So how do you get paid? How do you get paid? Uh, there's a couple of different revenue streams, uh, and uh, one of the things we realized early on is that going ahead and charging subscriptions to vendors would be a limiting factor. It was difficult for us to get folks on, and it's really the size of the community that's a key piece. So we focused on other revenue streams. So the other revenue streams we're looking at are premium services, so add-ons to the model. There's an advertising scenario there as well. And one of the cool things with this one, and which is different than my last startup, is that we own all the data. So we can actually, uh, we think we can repurpose the data in lots of different cases. All right, how about a hand? All right, so for our next demo, it's called Community Point. Can you tell me your name, please? Uh, Eric. Eric, what do you guys do at Community Point? Community Point uh, is basically your condo building online. Um, so communication within a condo building is an absolute disaster, as anybody who lives in a condo building knows. So we're trying to solve that. Uh, we're trying to make communication within a condo building much better and just make your day-to-day -day living as a condo owner, a uh, resident, a board member, or a property manager much better. How many people here live in a condo? So Eric, uh, what are you looking for from the community? 
Uh, well, we'd love to speak to either condo owners, so some people put your hand up, that's great, uh, as well as condo board members, or if you can give us access to a board member. All right, so we'll log into Community Point. Um, so it's awesome that we got some condo owners here tonight. Um, I, I live in a condo myself, I rent. Uh, but there are a lot of issues with communication in the condo, and as you know, there's a lot of paper involved. So a lot of paper up in elevators, a lot of slips of paper under your door, things like that. Um, and you really don't really know what's going on in your condo. Um, everything's very, very manual. Uh, and in 2011, it just feels very awkward to not have a system that you should be able to log into for everything that you need for your condo. So that's what Community Point is, and that's the problem we're getting at. So when you log in, uh, it's a very simple interface. Uh, everything on the left here gives you access to all the different parts of Community Point. Anything that you would need would be in here. So including things like your very basic stuff, like property overview. Um, so as you can see, we have Accelerator YYC condominium set up here. Um, so you have all your basic property management information, uh, any of the contact info that you can get. Now this is something you might find on a really basic um, condo website. If you're lucky enough to have a board that's going to put one together for you, you're probably not so lucky. Um, once you start going into some of the other parts here, we have things like key contacts. You can check out who your board members are. Um, boardroom documents, um, things like this. Uh, one big part of condos when it comes to information management is condo documents. So this includes your financial statements, uh, anything you need to buy and sell your condo. Now a lot of times a property manager will have a website set up uh, where they will sell you those documents uh, for hundreds of dollars um, that you're going to have to pay for them to photocopy them and send them to you. So why not give a website that board members and property managers can use um, and have the documents right on it. So if you go into resident information here, we have some other things that just allow the board um, to really get in touch with the residents and let them know what's going on. So one big thing with that is notices. So you can easily add a new notice, give it a date, give it a subject. A big one is water being shut off. Oh, you can see it's already populated. <laughs> water shut off Wednesday, um, which kind of sucks. Um, so, I mean, water shutoff's a big one. Uh, often shut off in my building, elevators are often shut down. Uh, pretty big pain, uh, and, and you don't really get a notification about this. Um, Community Point makes this pretty easy. Send notification to all residents, you click that off. Now, every, every uh, resident or owner has an account, and under their account settings, they can set whether they want to receive SMS, or if they want to receive emails, or both, for any sort of notice, or any of the other stuff that you see on the left here, whether it's a news bulletin, annual general meeting, um, meeting minutes if you're on the board, things like that. So if I submit that, um, some people in the room, hopefully if they have their, uh, <laughs> if they have their notifications turned on, will be receiving SMSs. Um, so we actually hooked up a bunch of people oh, in the hey. building here. Nice, oh. beauty, yeah. it works. <laughs> so water shut off Wednesday. If you log in, you'll find out it kind of sucks. Um, wow, that that was cool. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. So. <laughs> yeah, it keep, keeps everyone in the loop. Um, and that's a big thing, right? With stuff like water getting shut off and not being able to take a shower really sucks. And it's super easy to solve. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, is just really make everybody's day-to-day -day condo living much better. Um, so uh, the rest of the, the sort of features that we have here are things like message boards, which allow residents to talk to one another. You know, you want to sell a parking spot, you want to buy a parking spot, any of that sort of stuff. Uh, as well as bylaws, insurance policies, special reports. Um, any of the information that you need is in here, and it's just a one-stop shop. So I'm just going to add in, there's about uh, 20 million condos in, in the U.S., uh, and about probably 3 million in Canada. So what we're doing is about a buck a door per month as the pricing model. And uh, we think it's super cheap and really easy to get at. And so it's, you know, we think it's kind of, again, like a no-brainer. Uh, somebody's going to do this, it may as well be us, right? So... Uh, yeah, and V2 is going to be awesome. I'll see you here at some other point. So we're taking questions. Does everybody need to join, or do you just need their email address to blast out the notices? We, uh, they will join up. They'll have their own account. So, so they have to join up. They, they don't, what happens? They don't necessarily need to log in. So they'll have an account created for them. If they choose to log in, they can. Otherwise, uh, they don't have to. So. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this? And, uh, do you have any customers yet? Uh, right now, we have two condo buildings actively on board, paying monthly to use Community Point. Um, they're actually an awesome source of information for us. Uh, yeah, we can test out new features with them, things like that. Um, and what was your first question, sir? We've been doing this for about uh, total time. 
Um, two months. Yeah, about two <laughs> like months. Really, I just quit my job three weeks ago to come and uh, really go full time on Community Point. So. Yeah. And I'll plug in really quick that Accelerator YYC is a life changing experience. Is there a way for owners to input like renters' phone numbers and email addresses so that you can actually send the message directly to the renter? Uh, right now, no. That's actually a feature that we're actively working on at the moment. Um, so version two for sure, we want to have it so you can kind of have that hierarchy where you have owners. Uh, in a lot of buildings, there are a lot of residents. There's high percentages um, for certain buildings in Calgary. So then you'd have renters underneath the owner. Um, they can manage accounts that way. Uh, it's a great question. Do you own the data? Do we own the data? Yes, we do. So I'm standing right beside Christian here. And yeah. I saw the text that you that got sent when you sent the, the water note up. Yeah. The water shut up. Um, why don't you have a link in there, possibly, for anybody who has a smartphone who could just like click it and log in? Because you have a message that's there that yeah. says log in to, to details. Uh, we sent out HTML template emails that have the link in there telling you to log in. You, know, you can update your preferences very easily. Uh, we could for sure include a link in there. You know, it's something we never really thought of. I used to be part of a condo on the board for eight years. And our biggest struggle being part of the board was the management companies were very apprehensive to change. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I love what you guys are doing, you know, being disruptive in that space. But how do you guys plan to bypass the management companies or work around them? Um, it's something that Josh and I have talked about a lot. Um, we really want to create CUNY Point, you know, without sounding too grassroots-ish, you know, for the people. It's for the owners, it's for the condo board, they're the ones who are living there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it should really, really be for them. So the way that we're kind of circumventing that is we're trying to go directly to the board. So the board is a decision maker, they hire and fire the property managers. So if we can get the board excited about what this is, then they'll implement it and the property managers will use it. Um, and unfortunately, you won't necessarily have a, much of a choice. Um, a lot of the residents and owners that we've been talking to have also been super excited about and willing to go with their board to chat about it. Um, but that is a great question because it is a, a difficulty that we deal with. You guys need to empower champions of the board. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because like, our board was like one person that was active. Yeah. And the rest kind of just <laughs> followed and didn't do anything, right? Yeah. So. We should chat after about this. It's really interesting. So, go ahead. So I I guess we have sort of two kinds of uh, people in using the system. We have at least two. We have the people who are your owners, potential, of course, for the renters. That's mm -hmm. the third person. We have the people who are on the board. Mm -hmm. And I guess would the management company have their own accounts as yeah. well? Would they use limited access to things that actually not actually necessarily manage it or who actually, who actually runs the system? So we have owner accounts, renter accounts, board member accounts, and property manager accounts. So depending on what role you are, you'll have different access to things in the system. So for example, if I'm a resident, I'm not necessarily going to be able to send out a notice to absolutely everyone in the system, um, you know, for fun sort of thing. So, um, so basically there's, there's permission set in place for those sort of things. Uh, board and property managers are the ones that have, for sure, higher levels of access, being able to send out notices uh, and things like that. I mean, we're still going to some property managers and talking to them about the idea. Um, hopefully if all goes well, we'll get the um, the more progressive property manager companies, like you want to know what, I want to beat everyone else to the chase. I want to be the first ones to implement new technology in my buildings across my properties. So we'll, we'll figure out who that is. Um, it would be easier to try to solve that problem as opposed to try to, you know, handle the, the rebel route, you know, the grassroots. It's easier in the sense that their contact information is easily found. You can walk into any building and find a plaque on the wall saying, you know, Montgomery Ross, here's the info. Um, so it's easier to get in touch with them. But one, they're very conservative. And two, I think it's, um, what gets us up in the morning at the end of the day is that we're making something for the people who live in the building. Um, if I live in a building day to day, uh, I'd prefer if my property manager didn't have a tool to manage me. I'd be nice if I had a, a system for us, for everyone that I lived around. So. All right, how about a round of applause? We have launch party coming up. Here's one of the key organizers, Victoria. Uh, I'm one of the directors here at Accelerate YYC, so I just want to say thank you, everyone. We're, I mean, there's more than 100 people here, so that's amazing. Thank you for coming up. So, um, we start at Calgary, uh, where a nonprofit uh, organization uh, run by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs to bring the startup and tech community together. That's it. December 1st, tickets are $20. Just go to startupcalgary.ca and pick them up. So I think it's uh, early bird is until December, or sorry, November 23rd, and then they go up to $30. So pick them up. And where's it being held? 
It's happening at Mount Royal. This is Cam Linky, drove all the way down from Edmonton. Welcome, Cam. He's going to be demoing a little bit later, but uh, for now, we want him to talk about Startup Edmonton because he's one of the key organizers there. Yeah, so thanks, Pat. Um, so basically, in Edmonton, we started Startup Edmonton a couple years ago to help the creative and tech community in the city. Um, basically, we try to help creative and technical entrepreneurs and help their companies grow, um, whether it's through you know, different events to educate them, through space, um, some investment, and uh, different events that we run. Uh, so coming up, we have Demo Camp. Uh, Edmonton is on the 22nd um, up at the university. So if you want to check that out, come up to come and come up to Edmonton and check out startedmonton.com and you can find out more information about that. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. So I'm Corey Arsenault. Uh, every month we do startup drinks. Last Wednesday of the month, it's at, uh, well, it varies, but the district is where we've been having it. So last Wednesday, Startup Drinks Calgary. Hi everybody, this is Rick Roman, and I'm part of the organizing team of uh, Startup Weekend coming up next, this next February 3rd. And if you haven't heard about this one, it's basically in a weekend you get together with a bunch of cool guys and then you try to get a company started at the end of the weekend. So basically uh, at the end of the weekend you're going to present a pitch to a couple of investors and if you have a good idea, it will go on, okay? All right, I'm Eric, and uh, so I started a group here because I'm working a lot with uh, Node.js, so, uh, which is also kind of what we're doing with the hackathon this weekend, so I'm going to be around. But uh, I started a Node.js slash JavaScript meetup group, and we meet every the first Thursday of every month, uh, 6.30. We were kind of hosting it over at uh, the office where I'm working, but I think we're gonna be doing it here as long as the other guys are cool with it. I'm Ben, I'm a director of Protospace, which is Calgary's local hacker and maker space. Um, so we basically support um, technology and innovation for anybody who wants to come in and use our space and our tools. Um, so every Tuesday we have our just meet and geek nights where anybody can come out and just uh, meet who's at Protospace and uh, see what we're doing. And then we usually have uh, weekend workshops every once in a while. We have the Make Art Workshop coming up on the 26th, which is at Endeavor Arts, um, where we allow people to come in and we teach people how to solder. We teach people how to um, basically hack their old Christmas decorations to be 10 times better than what they originally were with like microcontrollers and LEDs. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty cool. And then I'm also... Of course. <laughs> then I'm also part of a little uh, startup that just kind of... Uh, started uh, sprouting in the last couple of days called Robot Academy where we're going to be um, basically bringing people in and teaching them how to make their own robots out of old toys. Uh, so I haven't set dates for that yet but uh, definitely is on the to-do list. And, uh, also at Protospace there's been uh, technical lectures so one was turned into a feature-length movie here it's called Thorium Remix 2011. Anyone who's heard about Thorium and you're a little bit curious please take a DVD. Ben, uh, what are you going to show us? I'm going to show you our application that automates printing and marketing, marketing material. Oh, sure. Alright, so I brought up our boring corporate website just so somebody could grab the URL if they wanted. Uh, there's not much there, so I'll jump to kind of the start page of our site. CIR print. Um, if anybody's seen CIR Realty, uh, they have all the bus ads. Um, a great experience, begins with a great real estate agent and all that. Um, what we did is we build portals where real estate agents can go into a branded application that looks like it's internal to their company and print feature sheets, business cards, postcards, folders, CMA covers, notepads, whatever they need. Um, if you think about it, realtors print a lot of stuff and by the nature of what they do, it's all franchised. So a big problem for Realtors, they don't want to have to source their own graphic designers to do stuff, and the people who own the franchise of CIR or the agency um, want to enforce their brand standards. So I'll show you how a regular realtor would log in here under the login. I'm going to go in through the back end as an admin and log in as Don. Sure, I'll pick a name. So if a realtor wanted to print a business card, after logging to the site, all they'd need to do is click, I want a business card. I want a, one of these eight templates that all follow the brand standards. And they can go in and they can start changing text however they want. So you could say that 
Maybe they forgot their middle name. They can change the color of the font. I don't know why you'd want a yellow business card, but uh, you could if you wanted. Um, if you happen to be part of an awards club, you can actually set that in your profile. So if you were the Cirrus Circle Award member, next time you load a business card, it will remember that, that you are a Cirrus Circle Award member. You can also go in and obviously upload your photograph. So I grabbed a nice stock photo of a realtor. You can go in. <laughs> you can go in and crop the photo. And there you are. There's your business card ready to go. You can click the preview button to verify that the PDF we generate, in fact, um, looks the way you want. One thing you might notice is the giant preview <laughs> over because we didn't want them printing their own and saving money. Um, <laughs> if, you go on, if you go on the back page, there's a couple of different options. You've got the standard back for the business card and the second choice with the different office locations for CIR and the blank option. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so I, once you've done that, you can go to your print options, you pick your quantity, sign off on the print, add it to the cart. If you place the order, it would actually be tied in with the invoicing system of CIR Realty. Now this is in production now, so I won't <laughs> print any cards on his behalf. Uh, if we go back and grab an order real quick, we also do feature sheets, so I'll show you how that works. Since every house in Canada that's sold has an MLS number from MLS.ca, there we go, so we type in the MLS number of a house. We're going to go into the database for MLS.ca, MLS who we have a partnership with, grab all the information on your room sizes, square footage, location, address, and all that information. Uh, this could take a second. And then we've auto-generated a feature sheet. Uh, we've also, we all also automatically pull in the images from MLS.ca so the realtor doesn't have to re-upload everything. You can just go in and crop it all. You can see all your information's there. You can re-upload your beautiful photo of yourself. Throw that in. Whoops. Go to the back side. And you'll see that there's the same thing. If you uh, want, there's a we keep track of all your agency's images they can use. Um, so commercial real estate realtor might be a logo you want to add to your brochure. So you can just grab it and drag it wherever you want, resize it. Um, obviously these we don't let you crop, unlike uh, a photo of yourself. And then you just go next. Do, if you want a PDF only, we'll charge you $8.50 to have a PDF without a watermark. And then there's our pricing for the different quantities. You ship it to whichever one of the Calgary offices you want, um, depending on which brokerage you're with in Canada, there'll be different locations you can ship to. And we have a print provider named Data Group, which is one of the largest printers in Canada. And we can expedite if you order a feature sheet by 2 p.m. on Monday, you'll have it by 10 a.m. the next morning printed. And if anybody wants to see, we have physical versions of what we print if anybody's curious. So that's it. I, I, in the past year, I've been in the process of building a house, um, which means that I've gone through a lot of realtor, like a lot of realtor stuff. Uh, one of the biggest problems that I've seen in uh, realtor ads, especially when you're looking at development properties, is uh, zoning. When you look at zoning, say something that's RC2, uh, it might be specific to different uh, different regions. Um, there are there are very specific things. There are so many realtors that just make up crap that goes into that field that doesn't mean anything and you'll even see it on like their their listings at the at the actual property on the sign and it means nothing so i'm wondering if you guys have uh, have the capability or might think of the capability of giving them a pre-populated list of what actually that location could possibly be or look at the history of what the what the property is to look at what the actual zoning is, it is actually very important for people who are looking for development so, properties. Be the software, just make it really accurate what the zoning is with yeah. every time. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Uh, yeah.
What other business verticals do you guys have right now other than realty? Uh, we're starting with real estate and there are others we are looking into doing, but real estate in Canada is our first market, which is quite large. I think there's just over 100,000 realtors in Canada. How many That's employees do you have? Uh, Rohan and I, and uh, Rob's involved, wherever you are. He's not an employee, and then there's the owner. Oh, and a, and a graphic designer out of the country. I haven't met too many uh, tech-savvy realtors. How do you uh, help that situation out? <laughs> uh, well, part of, and that's something we're dealing with now, um, we can get buy-in from the real estate agency because a big problem for them is somebody will print a feature sheet that looks like crap, which makes their brand look like crap. Um, or they'll put hot pink on a background of a photo or something, and that's not good for the agency, so we can try, we really can get buy-in from the agency level, which means, yes, non-tech savvy realtors might have trouble with it, but they're somewhat pushed to use it, and that's kind of the case we're having with our first customer. Um, also, via that back-end system you might have seen for a few seconds, they can have a graphic designer do it on their behalf and then add a fee if they really want it, I guess, from uh, the brokerage side of things. So we could have somebody at the company do it in a fraction of the time it would take to do traditionally with a graphic designer or they could learn it themselves. Either way. More on the pricing model. So a percentage or? Uh, the the revenue, gener product, revenue generation. We sell the printed product, it will be delivered to you the next morning, and we have pricing with our uh, print providing. Yeah. And commercial, probably not just focus on residential? Or? We're focusing on residential because it's a really huge market, and um, the owner of the company is a realtor himself, so it's kind of a market he knows, and we've been fo we're focusing on that first. You only have CIR listed, or, or do you have uh, other we're companies? CIR on Century 21. Oh, yeah. What technologies did you use to build this? Uh, it's uh, all Java with Google Web Toolkit for the front end and MySQL Hibernate for database access and a lot of Google Juice. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Uh, any other questions? Sweet. Right. Good round right. applause. Cam, how are you? Good, are you done? I don't suppose you're nervous about this, are you? No. No, okay, so I'm not even going to bother introducing you because I only do that stuff to kind of get people at ease with the introduction. Um, so if you want to play along with our demo um, and you have an iPhone, go to the App Store and download Surveyor 2. Make sure it's Surveyor 2. We're phasing out the first version. It'll ask you for a pairing code, so use 567-794. I'll leave that just briefly while I'm talking here. And, uh, and you can play along. Joel's gonna tweet it. So basically what we do at Touchmetric and what we're doing with Surveyor is um, we're solving the problem that people spend way too much time and money on data collection. So whether they're at a trade show and trying to collect leads or they're out in the field trying to count how many mosquitoes they have um, in a certain puddle or they're doing a market research survey, regardless, um, they spend a whole bunch of time and money basically collecting all that information, then paying somebody to digitize it after, and there's a long lag time between when that collection happened and when, uh, when they get their information that they get to do something with. Um, so we're going to show you really quickly what we do here. So first thing, when you end up logging in, um, you, get, you get your dashboard here and you're able to create your survey. All of this is done kind of through your, through your editor here. You can choose your different questions and then edit the questions over here. So I'm able to just say, you know, start out with a display question and then move on to, um, move on to the various question types that I want to do. So in this case, I want to just say, you know, uh, I want to do an inspection, how icy were the, was the sidewalk when I came in. Um, I just add an option. So I'm doing a scale of one to five here, uh, two, Three, we're only doing a scale of one to three now. Um, so that's our that's our multiple choice. Uh, multiple choice questions can basically either say um, they can be mutually exclusive or not. So I can only answer this question, or maybe I want people to be able to answer one, two, and three. I don't know why in this case, but maybe it'd be super icy if you did that. Um, after which, I just hit save and it's ready to go. As soon as I save a uh, question, as soon as I make any saves here, if the device is connected it will sync the new survey up and all the, all the changes will go straight there. So what ends up happening is actually for a lot of academic researchers, 
is uh, they end up printing off like 10,000 surveys for all their students to fill out. Um, and then they realize that they put a typo in there and then they kill like another forest um, to try and do that. And then they get mad because their budget is like, they just blew their budget all on paper. Um, there are other question types that people are able to do. So we make it easy and as quick as possible for people to enter in different things. In this case, we might want to ask for a phone number. So we get them to, we add, uh, we do the key, uh, number type keyboard. Um, so if they're doing a number or an email or something like that, that's the right keyboard pops up for them at the right time. And it makes it a lot quicker for them to, uh, to do things. So I'm not going to go through the whole survey. The last thing I'll just show is, um, we also have map questions. Um, that's gonna, we have a little styling thing there that we wanna change, but basically this will pull up a map and people can say, you know, where do you live or what do you, you know, what do you do, where do you work, that type of thing. Um, people are able to um, basically drop a bomb or drop a pin on, uh, on where they live um, to, get that, to get that data. So if you're going through the Demo Camp YYC survey, you'll see that in there, um, as well as some of these other question types. Um, pairings, I've already showed you pairings, so basically that happens you know, with the number here, um, I'll end up, you know, pairing my device. I go, you know, five, six, seven, seven, nine, four. Pair device. And now the surveys that I just created are all, nope. Um, this is why you don't do things on the iPhone uh, simulator. So be, maybe look at the person beside you who has an iPhone. A demo survey of, so, all right, so this is where you like get all flustered while you're trying to do a demo. Um, so look, thankfully we have a demo survey on there. People just click, as they do one question at a time and click through, so I can click here, choose different options. Um, in this case, you know, multiple options can be selected like I was showing. Um, you can have something be required, so if somebody doesn't want to answer this, um, we make them answer it. And you know there are various the various different types, and then here's where you know you can drop a pin on. Hey, I live over on you know, Union, and I live in I live in Pioneer Park because my demo went bad. And now I live on the streets. Um, <laughs> you know, clicking on email brings up the email keyboard, um, on and on. Um, so in my last minute, I'll just show really quickly. Basically, what we do is once you're once you're done the survey, so. Uh, once I'm done my demo camp YYC survey and we all say that Pat's going to buy us drinks after demo camp, um, I can export that data, save it, so it just saves it in CSV format and then people are able to use whatever tool they want to analyze that data, so whether it's SPSS, Excel, Numbers. Um, this is actually, I'll show you a quick example from Google Fusion tables. So um, this is uh, one of the examples of surveys that we have when people download the app. Um, we ask for what their location is. So this is a bunch of different locations that people have basically submitted example surveys from after they downloaded the app. Um, and it's an example of people using, you know, basically you being able to use it using fusion tables. So that's, that is it. That's my demo. So any questions? How do you make money? Um, so we charge basically per device per month. So the more devices you have out in the field, um, the more you pay. How do we understand this pairing code thing? Um, okay, so what, did you download the app? Yeah. And you tap pairing code. So if you you would sign up online and you get a code that would attach your account online to your app. Um, what was the inspiration? It basically came out of a, a marketing company that we were working with a while ago um, that were out doing a ton of surveys. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that we work online or offline, so a lot of people don't want to send people out um, with or pay for people to have iPod with uh, data connections on there or anything like that, or iPod or uh, sorry iPads with data connections on there. Um, so you can work offline; it stores it all on device, then shoots it back. Um, so basically, it came out contract we had with a marketing company. Comment on the pairing code. Why don't you yeah. make that a little bit more automated? Because that does seem a little bit unfriendly. We we actually haven't had anybody who actually logs in have any problems with that. Um, there are some things on the devices page that we're doing around you know actually explaining all the steps. Um, so that page is getting a little bit of love, um, but. Beyond that, uh, we actually haven't had any problems with it so far, so we haven't spent too much time on it. Do you have yeah. an attachment feature to leverage the uh, onboard camera? We haven't yet, but we're constantly adding question types, so we actually get more people asking for images in there, so 
I don't know, do you recognize this person or something like that? We could do like, who looks better, Pat Lohr or Sean Abbott or something like that. Um, you know, I don't know if everybody wants that specific use case, but um, we actually have, we've had a lot of requests for images in there, so that's coming soon. Um, and then pictures would be another one for a lot of people doing inspections. Uh, is there any way to control the workflow? So for example, if you have um, sets of questions or multiple surveys, would yeah. you be able to have some that are deactivated then activate them later? Not yet, but yes soon. Um, so two of, the, two of the things are coming like basically within the next couple of weeks are duplicating surveys and then the ability to turn given surveys on and off that are connected to devices. How long have you been developing? Um, so basically the version that we just released has been approximately the last six months. Do you have a focus to take that data and do something with it rather than just give it to the end user and their raw CSV like analytics? Or? There are a lot of things once we have that data in there that we can do, um, whether it's helping them with prediction or, or analysis of that, those type of things. Um, right now we want to solve the first problem that is just collecting it and letting people use the tools they already use. So people already use Excel and Numbers and SPSS in a lot of cases um, to do all their analysis on it. Um, the biggest problem is they just basically spent t pay somebody like $700 to sit there and like enter surveys. I got paid $2,000 in university to enter in a whole bunch of um, research surveys that people did um, and that should have all been automated. The competition. Um, so specific to what we do, there's a couple companies, but not anybody that, like nobody really owns that market. I mean, there's certainly SurveyMonkey and SurveyGizmo and stuff like that. And if you want to just mass email people and do that type of thing, they're, like, we're not trying to compete with them on that. So there are survey companies, but as far as actually doing offline surveys um, specific to this use case, there, there isn't a lot of competition. Yeah. You know about turning it into a service, like buying half a dozen Android iPads or something like that and then renting it out to you know, people that are going to do exhibits for a month or something like that? Um, yeah, so we have done that a bit, but that becomes like, that's all of a sudden like a warehouse problem for us where we're storing a whole bunch of things or we're storing them by city and renting them out. Um, for most people, it's actually pretty good. The reason we started with iOS is it's a $200 device. And if you look at like a trade show, they charge you like $350 just to like rent whatever program they're using for that one trade show. So most people think it's a pretty good investment. All awesome, right. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so remember, stick around, uh, exchange uh, business cards or contacts with people. Uh, we're gonna have these five companies plus another three or four companies demoing their stuff. Um, before we, Victoria, how long are these guys allowed to stay for? Like 12, 1, till the beer runs out? So feel free to stick around, $3 beers. Thank you again to Steam Whistle.